This is another example of using the Buckingham Pi Theorem to simplify a complicated system. So let's get right to it. First step is find out what the heck we're doing. <laughs> Problem here is we want to find the pressure loss in a turbulent pipe. So flow is going to be going through some pipe. We know it's turbulent. We want to find the pressure drop in there. All right, so first thing we're going to do, list all the variables involved in the system. So the geometry could be the diameter, the length, and some measure of the roughness of the pipe that we'll call E. Usually that's like an average size of the bumps in the wall. Fluid properties that might be relevant include viscosity and density. Uh, external effects. We're driving this thing at some flow velocity, so we'll call that V. So those are all the things that could affect what we're after, which is delta P. And so we're going to write this as some function, unknown function phi, of velocity, diameter, length, roughness, viscosity, and density. This is a little sloppy. This is supposed to be epsilon, not a T. There you go. Okay. Second step is to express each of these variables in terms of its basic dimensions. Okay, we're going to use MLT this time. So the hardest one is actually the first one, delta P. Okay, remember delta P is a force per area, which is length squared, but we want to replace the force because we're using the mass system. So force is equal to MA. So we just stick it in like so. And that lets us see that we've got mass acceleration here. We know is length per time squared. And then we're left with a 1 over length squared. And so a little bit of canceling there gives us that we could replace that force, that pressure, with a mass per time. Oops, mass per time squared per length minus 1. So delta P looks like. M L to the minus 2, I'm sorry, M T to the minus 2, L to the minus 1. Okay, velocity, well, that looks like distance per time, L T to the minus 1. Diameter, diameter is a length, the length, well, that's a length. The roughness is also some length, the measure of the size of the bumps. Viscosity can be written as mass per length per time. And finally, density is mass per volume. So we got mass L to the minus 3. Okay, so next step, we're going to count the number of required terms. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven variables. We used mass, length, and time, so that's three base dimensions. And so we're going to need a total of four pi terms. Now we've got to work on our repeating variables a bit. We don't want to use our dependent variable, delta P. And so that leaves all the rest of them as candidates. We could use V. We could use D, we could use length, epsilon, viscosity, or density. What we want to do is pick them in a way that they represent the whole range of base dimensions without being multiples of each other. And so I propose that we use diameter to capture our length. Let's use velocity to bring in the time. And let's use density to bring in the mass. So those are our repeating variables. And we'll be left then with one, two, three, four non-repeating variables that are going to go into our four pi terms. So let's start out with our first one. Our first pi term, pi 1, is going to be our dependent variable, which is delta p, delta p. Uh, not, not equals to, sorry. And we're going to multiply that delta p by our repeating variables raised to powers a 
B, C. Next, we just sub in each of these things base dimensions, and so we get m t to the minus 2, l to the minus 1. We got d, which was a length to the a. We've got velocity, which, I'm sorry, we've got velocity, which is a length per time to the b. And last, we had density, which was mass length to the minus 3 to the c. So now we can write three equations, one for mass, one for length, one for time. The mass equation tells us mass here to the 1 over here to the c has to equal 0 if we want the mass, if we want it to be unitless. The length looks like a minus 1 plus a plus b minus 3c equals 0. And the time looks like minus 2 minus b equals 0. All right, so we can solve this one directly, and it gives us that c is equal to minus 1. We could solve this one, and it tells us that b is equal to minus 2. And we take both of those and sub them in, and it tells us that A is actually equal to 0. And so our first pi term then, pi 1, is equal to delta P, D to the 0, V to the minus 2, and rho to the minus 1, which we could write as delta P over rho V squared. Okay, we're going to repeat that for each of our variables, each of our non-repeating variable groups. All right, and so I'm going to go to a blank page here so we can do it. But the next one up, we just did delta P. Let's go ahead and do viscosity next. Okay, so pi 2 is going to be viscosity multiplied by our three repeating variables raised to the ABC again. We again sub in the base dimensions that we found in step two. That lets us write three equations, one for mass, which looks like one plus c, we want that to equal zero, one for the length, which looks like minus one plus a, plus b minus 3c equals 0, and one for the time, which looks like, I'm sorry, I miswrote, this is a minus 1, excuse me. So we got a minus 1 minus b, minus b equals 0. We solve this, we get that c is equal to minus 1. This one tells us b is equal to minus 1, and this one tells us then that a is equal to minus 1. And so pi 2 can be written as mu d to the minus 1, v to the minus 1, rho to the minus 1, which is equal to mu over rho v d. We'll call that pi 2. Okay, so now we've handled two of our non-repeating variables, right? We did delta p and mu. Let's go ahead and do the length L. And so pi 3 is going to be L d to the A, V to the B. Oh, that got sloppy, sorry. V to the B, rho to the C. So that's a length times a length to the A. Velocity is L t to the minus 1 to the b and ml minus 3 to the L. Sorry, to the c. So that gets us three equations again one for length, which says 1 plus a plus, let's see here. We've got a 1 here, we've got an a there, we've got a 
B here and a minus 3C there all has to equal zero. Time only shows up once, so minus B is equal to zero. And mass also only shows up once as C. So that tells us C is equal to zero. This tells us B is equal to zero. Sub those in here, and it tells us that A is equal to minus one. And so pi three just comes out to be L D to the minus one, V to the zero, rho to the zero, which is just L over D. Okay, the last one we need to do is roughness, little e here. So we'll do the same thing, pi 4 It's going to be epsilon d to the a, v to the b, rho to the c. And if I write one more step, you'll see it's actually the same as this one, right? Because epsilon is just another length, l to the a. L t to the minus 1 to the b, and L to the minus 3 to the c. And so we already solved that because it's the same as this thing here. And so we can just write that pi 4 is equal to epsilon over d. Right? Because a, b, and c are going to come out to the same values that they did for our third pi term. OK. The next step would be to check our work. I promise I did it right, but you should check your work as you do these for yourself. And so the next thing we're going to do is re rearrange some of our pi terms. Okay, The first one that I want to look at is actually pi 1. So pi 1 here we wrote as delta p over rho v squared. Uh, dynamic pressure is something that's very common, and that looks like a 1 half rho v squared. And so that doesn't bring any units to it, but we're actually going to replace pi 1 with delta p. We're going to make it 1 half rho v squared. So I haven't changed anything. We just added the 1 half. And we're allowed to do that just because there's no dimensions on it. So we haven't really done anything. Uh, pi 2 might look familiar. Pi 2, once again, looks like 1 over the Reynolds number. So we can just replace that with the Reynolds number, uh, rho v d over mu. Reminder, that's the Reynolds number. And then pi 3 looks like L over D. Pi 4 looks like E over D. We'll leave those alone. And so finally, what we want to do is just write this out as an expression. So delta P over 1 half rho V squared should be a function of so some unknown function phi of rho V D over mu L over D and E over D, epsilon over D, epsilon. Well, that came out sloppy, sorry. Epsilon over D. Uh, just backtracking for half a second, there's a whole table of common terms that shows up in the book. And you can go look through and see there's a thing that looks like delta P over rho V squared, uh, but it has a half on there. So we're just going to snag that. So now what we would do is we would go out and we would construct an experiment that varies each of these three things independently, and that gives us this function. And now we can use this to describe complicated systems. OK, so that really finishes what I wanted to show you here. However, if you want to hang on for a little bonus, check this out. You'll get to find out where that Moody diagram came from. So one of the things that we know is that delta p is probably going to be proportional to the length. So let's assume that delta p is proportional to the length. Where'd that come from? Well, it came from fluid theory. Actual physics, not the dimensional analysis that we just did. OK, so you actually know that fluid theory by now, right? Delta p looks like 4 tau wall times what? Well, L over D. And so delta P is, in fact, proportional to L over D. And what that means is 
we know if it's proportional, we can just yank this right out of the function and because it's a function times a constant. And so we could write this as delta p over 1 half rho v squared is now equal to L over d times some new function phi. We can call it phi prime if you like. I don't like that because you might think it's a derivative. Let's just leave it alone. Uh, rho v d over mu e over d. Okay, that's neat because now I can just slap these onto the other side of the equation as delta p d over 1 half rho v squared L. And that now is some function of rho v d over mu and epsilon over d. And this might look familiar. This we've named the friction factor F. Delta P D over one half rho V squared L. And so that means we could write this function now as friction factor F is some unknown function phi of Reynolds number and relative roughness D, which you've seen, right? That's the Moody diagram. The Moody diagram, if you remember, looks like this. It had two axes. This one was Reynolds number. This one was friction factor. And then over here, uh, we had different lines for different roughnesses, E over D. I think it starts out kind of like this, and then it, it gets wonky in the middle, but there were these different curves for different roughnesses. That's where it came from.